Um, so welcome everyone to, to the to the afternoon session of this conference. Um, it promises to be a really um, interesting one with a you know with a very exciting lineup of papers. Um, we have four presenters with us today. Um, Srinjoy Datta will go first, and then there is a slight uh, slight change in the in the order. Um, Lakshmi Menon will be speaking next, um, followed by Namita Paul. And then finally, we have Mohit Abron. So um, um, welcome to all the speakers. And um, um, you know, without, without uh, wasting more time, um, let me turn to Srinjoy. Srinjoy um, is a PhD student at um, the Center of English Studies um, in JNU. And um, we'll be speaking today on um, the poet as a queer flanner envisaging the local city in the poetry of Frank O'Hara. So um, over to you, Srinjoy. Um, you have 15 minutes and yeah. we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll follow that with a quick um, five minute Q&A. All right, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khanna. I'll just share my screen. Um, I'd like to introduce the chair who was uh, kind okay. and gracious enough to um, not waste any time and start right away. But you were just uh, hearing Dr. Stuti Khanna. She is going to chair this session and to give her uh, to give you all a brief introduction uh, she is currently an associate professor of english literature in the department of humanities and social sciences at iit delhi uh, she has an experience of over two decades of teaching uh, last year uh, in 2020 she came out with a book called writing the city looking within mm -hmm. looking without the contemporary novel and the city, reconceiving national and narrative form. Some of her re recent publications include Desire and Disappearance in Delhi, Out of Place in Delhi, Some Vignettes of Laws, Writing the Margins in English, Notes from Three Indian Cities, Crime, Media, and the People, Murder Most Foul and City Mythologies. Her research interests are cinema, translation, South Asia, the novel, gender, modernism, and of course, cities. Thank you, ma'am, for chairing this session. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you now, Srinjoy. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to quickly share my uh, screen. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Thank you. Right, um, so I'll get directly into my paper. Uh, it's titled The Poet as a Queer Flanner Envisage Envisaging the Local City in the Poetry of Frank O'Hara. Um, in the book, Hyperscapes, in the poetry of Frank O'Hara, Difference Homosexuality Topography, Hazel Smith employs the term hyperscape to denote a postmodern site which is discontinuous, contradictory, heterogeneous, economically uneven and constantly changing, and explores the same as a conceptual as well as formal pivot of Frank O'Hara's poetic oeuvre. As a queer American and a leading proponent of the 1950s New York School, his poetry, influenced as it were, by a variety of incongruent literary styles and a postmodernist queer ethos, then becomes a radical textual experiment that revisions the city as a text, especially from the perspective of the queer flaneur. The poet appears to be in an osmotic relationship with it insofar as his poetry continually deterritorializes and reterritorializes both the ontic as well as the ontological foundation of his environment. The paper will locate O'Hara's poetry and his city as a site which textually births the local, sensorial, ever-shifting rhizomatic assemblage. Smith's pioneering work on O'Hara is instrumental in understanding the poet in two fundamental ways. First, as a proto-postmodernist who anticipates the birth of the movement, and second, as a collective embodiment of significant concepts like landscape, cityscape, hypertext, and hyperspace. This transgressing of time, space, disciplines, and identities allows the poet to engage in a deeply metapoetic and mythopoetic process that is nonetheless acutely aware of its socio-political and cultural context. Insofar as O'Hara's work can be treated as a Derridian event, pervaded as it were by non-linear readings of singular subjects, contradictory images, discontinuities and non-sequiturs as Smith calls it, the question then arises as to the possibility of a global consciousness that founds itself on selective, specific cultural archival. Further woven into this kind of complex consciousness that champions its non-adherence to established paradigms is a continual emphasis on the I as poet, as flaneur and as a writer. Smith describes this idiosyncratic trait as a personalized hyperpolitics and challenges the apparently apolitical nature of O'Hara's work. 
Using this as a critical springboard, the paper delves into three distinct concepts working in tandem with each other. The first revolves around envisioning the city in O'Hara's poetry from the perspective of a queer flanner. The second deals with the idea of the phenomenal logically gaze as given to multiplicity insofar as it is both outwards, inwards, as well as worldly. And the third traces the possibility of a radical global consciousness that founds itself on both tangible and mythic systems of textual and lived kinship patterns. The archetype of the Flinner as it emerged in the 20th century with Walter Benjamin's reading of Baudelaire's poetry has undergone several reconceptualizations usually seen as an urban individual and an idle explorer of uh, public life especially the streets, the concept exploded into the literary scene as emblematic of a man ensconced within the industrialized modernist experience. Since then, critical engagement with the concept has allowed for uh, feminist, queer, as well as postmodernist reimaginings of the persona. The female counterpart to the flaneur, that is the flaneuse, challenged the implicit gender and class privilege of the original and foregrounded the notion of the commodifying male gaze as central to flannery as an activity. Thus, the experiential order of the female flaneur had to be reimagined, taking into account questions of class, race, ability, etc., along with, of course, gender. Taking from such a revisioning, the queer flaneur then posed more complicated problems vis a vis the heteronormative gaze and the politics of queer visibility and its potential to subvert orthodox structures of being. In the context of America, especially after the Stonewall riots, queer subcultures had become concretized phenomenon, even as queer theory sought to formulate scholarship that focused on gender as an analytical model. The queer flinner, subject to physical and mental violence as it were, also emerged as a radical symbol of power in the very act of occupying the public space and turning their gaze towards that very public and its activities. Within this context, O'Hara's poetic personas, which actually precede this phenomenon, become an embodiment of that power in two ways. First, the persona is able to reorder the experience spe specifically from a queer perspective. And more importantly, they're able to challenge the unidirectional idea of the gaze as it emerges with tr the traditional conceptualization of the flaneur into a more cyclical, um, so, uh, cyclical sort of process where the spectator turns into the spectacle and vice versa. Further, the concept of space as a socially constructed and produced phenomenon, as posited by Henri Lefebvre, undergoes a radical postmodernist revisioning insofar as the production of that space and the relationships that emerge therein are given to continual heterotopic relocation. The creation and production of the city as a hyperscape in O'Hara's writings is then to be understood in retrospect as foreshadowing the notions of simulation and hypertextuality. The intertextual kinship networks that are created in his poetry, they act as textual mappings of the materiality of the city inhabited by the poet, such that the network or nexus is both in the city, that is New York, and outside of it. Further, with emphasis on non-binary sexual identities as well as performativity, the city acts as a shape-shifting metropolis that is both steeped in local landmarks and proper nouns, but also evocative of the global order in its exploration of queer ontological constellations. Taking from Smith's work, it becomes amply clear that O'Hara's poetic personas managed to traverse the path from Baudelaire's Flaneur to Baudrillard's Simulacra. In Walking to Work, a poem that he uh, writes, he formally evokes the idea of textual movement and says that I am becoming the street. Desire in the globalized hyperscape is then the exercise of embodying the city as a self and the self as the city. The hyperscape is also inundated with signs of rapid consumerism and a growing culture industry driven by the logic of late capitalism. The poet persona as he walks down the street often participates in this consumption insofar as he is able to visualize and experience the ontic category of the commodity as burdened with the weight of ontological meaning. In a step away from them, he writes, it's my lunch hour, so I go for a walk among the hum-colored cabs onto Times Square where the sign blows smoke over my head Neon in daylight is a great pleasure, as Edwin Denby would write, as are light bulbs in daylight. I stop for a cheeseburger at Juliet's Corner, a glass of papaya juice and back to work. My heart is in my pocket. It is poems by Pierre Riverdy. The phenomenological in O'Hara's poetry is performed by the gaze that is multiple and nonlinear. It is at once exteriorized and interiorized, such that the city as the text acts as a trope to view the world as an artifact as well as allow the cognizance of the world viewing the poetic consciousness as an artifact. This consciousness rooted as it were in material immediacy, nonetheless envisions a possible global outlook that allows the compulsory and self-inflicted death of the author by the continually re-territorialized eye. 
Thus, the mapping of the persona onto the city as a text is an exercise in querying the global sensorium through a self-reflexive movement of the mind as well as the body. The poet's body and the poetic body in the mode of the performative become an amalgam of the cities as well as the world's semiotic legacies and histories. Elizabeth Groves in Space, Time and Perversion theorizes a model of interface between the body and the city, not as quote, uh, megalithic total entities, but as assemblages or collections of parts capable of crossing the thresholds between substances to form linkages, machines, provisional and often temporary sub or micro groupings. This model is practical based on the productivity of bodies and cities in defining and establishing each other. In that strain, the poem Grand Central is exemplary. O'Hara writes, the wheels are inside me thundering. They do not churn me, they are inside. They were not oiled, they burn with friction and out of my eyes comes smoke. I don't have an American body, I have an anonymous body, though you can get to love it if you love the corpses of the Renaissance. I'm reconstructed from a model of poetry. The subversion of the Cartesian logic can also be found in the poem In Memory of My Feelings, where he describes it as grace to be born and live as variously as possible. As topographies and textualities are continuously simulated, his poetry then becomes an example of the postmodernist idea of the map on route, as opposed to the survey in advance way of living and writing. O'Hara's walk poems then revision the idea of the flaneur in the city as a corporeal but fluid queer entity. This movement takes place within space as well as time, as patterns of kinship are forged within the production of the city as well as history. In some poems, not only does O'Hara incorporate different languages, but there's also a deliberate sort of stylistic nod to poetic predecessors, be it in terms of people or experiments in form. For instance, in poem read at Joan Mitchell's, O'Hara writes, it's so original, hydrogenic, anthropomorphic, fiscal, post-anti-aesthetic, bland, unpicturesque, and William Carlos Williamsian. It's definitely not 19th century. It's not even partisan review. It's new, it must be vanguard. The phenomenological gaze then allows for the explosion of a metonymic subjectivity and a deeply self-reflexive consciousness towards the fantastical idealization of cosmopolitanism, birthed by the immediacy of the mind, the body, and a sense of community that takes cognizance of a global public domain of heterogeneous strangers. In constant anticipation of and inviting the conceptual other, the ontological as well as existential thematic of the persona then becomes a delusion assemblage instead of an ossified singular entity. Further, the forging of experience as simultaneously individual as well as collective, along with the continual fashioning of the self as always already othered and various, while imbuing everyday objects with existential and ontological meaning, signals an embracing of Derisian artifactuality. Memory and experience as they pass through the global commodification of culture then becomes a selective process, uh, process, often fabricated as a narrative, fictitious in its form, but equally real in a world that is subject to simulated experiences. The nature of this remake also occurs through a deliberate use of the postmodern pastiche, which employs variegated and incongruent images, symbols and styles, and refuses the comfort of a cohesive argument. The more parodic tone and tenor of most of O'Hara's poetry stem from an insistence on fluid identity formations and a very vehement denial of affiliation to theoretical moorings. While the walking poet more often than not deals with serious subject matter, the quasi-satiric nature of the treatment connotes the possibility of not taking oneself too seriously. Critics have pointed towards the almost egocentric sort of thrust in a lot of his poems, wherein the focus on the eye seems to overshadow the content itself. But O'Hara's eye is riddled with ambivalence in the metapoetic sense, insofar as the moment the eye is concretized as a discrete individual entity, it is deconstructed and relocated within the body of the poem, as well as the body of the city. In that sense, the poet and the poem is made up, manufactured and alive through a set of embodied experiences around different locales and sites of being. Further, the rhizomatic nature of the poet persona transgresses loci and establishes itself as O'Hara calls it, upon the open flesh of the world. This can also be seen within patterns of kinship that O'Hara forges, but also challenges through parodic allusions and references. In the poem Autobiographia Literaria, which evokes, uh, sorry, and simultaneously mocks uh, uh, Coleridge's famous work and subsequently the English canon itself, he deconstructs the high philosophical tone of the original and describes himself in the autobiographical strain as a lonely, often ostracized child who liked to play with dolls. Immediately after that, he shifts the reader's attention 
from the aforementioned pitiful image to one of a young man uh, as an established poet worthy of critical attention. He writes, and here I am, the center of all beauty, writing these poems, imagine. This kind of attempt at a metapoetic as well as mythopoetic persona, devoid of the conventions of literary gravitas, as well as the norms of highbrow literary criticism, is foregrounded well in personism and manifesto. O'Hara writes, everything is in the poems, but at the risk of sounding like the poor wealthy man's Allen Ginsberg, I will write to you because I just heard that one of my fellow poets thinks that a poem of mine can't be got at one reading. It's because I was confused too. Personism, a movement which I recently founded and nobody knows about, interests me a great deal, being so totally opposed to this kind of abstract removal that it is verging on a true abstraction for the first time really in the history of poetry. What can we expect from personism? This is getting good, isn't it? Everything, but we won't get it. It's too new, too vital a movement to promise anything. Similarly, when asked to formulate a statement for the Patterson Society, he writes, well, you can't have a statement saying my poetry is the Sistine Chapel of verse, or my poetry is just like Pollock, de Kooning, and Gustin rolled into one great verb, unquote. In that sense, the incongruency of form, theme, style, and image points towards a poet who espouses the generalist's view of things while parodying the same. Along with this, the practice of intimate referentiality serves two purposes. It allows for the pseudo canonization of a poet who refutes the canon at every step, even as he alludes to it. And it allows the erstwhile ostracized queer identity to be recorded in the exercise of countercultural canon formation. In keeping with the artifactual nature of his poetry, O'Hara's fashioning of the global self is then an attempt to both subversively historicize himself in a literary tradition and mythologize the self as having transcended the same tradition. Memory and history are then imbued with the concept of the world as family or the worlded family. In Memorial Day, he writes, and those of us who thought poetry was crap throttled by Auden or Rambo, when sent by some compulsive Juno, we tried to play with collages or sprextime in their bed. Poetry didn't tell me not to play with toys, but alone, I could never have figured out that dolls meant death. A locomotive is more melodious than a cello. I dress in oil cloth and read music by Guillaume Apollinaire's Clay Candelabra. The Dionysian excess that informs much of O'Hara's poetry is also a ruthless assertion of countercultural communal living and loving. An ode to joy evokes both the violence of marginalization as well as the fantastical hope of the immortality of his ideas. The quasi mythologizing tenor of the poem allows the possibility of the quotidian as a transcendent idea, as well as the possibility of existing beyond the corporeal. We shall, he writes, we shall have everything we want and there'll be no more dying on the pretty plains or in the supper clubs. For our symbol, we'll acknowledge vulgar materialistic laughter over an insatiable sexual appetite, pouring hunger through the heart to feed desire in intravenous ways, which wants us to remain for cocktails in a bar and after dinner, lets us live with it, no more dying. This excess can also be read as the messianic impulse of a poet who's always already a futural entity, that is someone who merely through the exercise of walking and reordering the world continues to arrive on the literary as well as global spatio-temporal scene. Mark Ford in his introduction to uh, Frank O'Hara's selected poems points out that only a poet who delights in mobility, in metamorphosis, in excess, in consumption by bridging the hierarchy between the quotidian and the lofty could have written a poem titled, You are gorgeous and I'm coming. This is made possible because of the continual reconfiguration of the space-time continuum that the poet occupies at any given moment, and thus the potential of rhizomatic living is always already exceeding the possibilities of the corporeal as well as the written body. Moving from poetic performance to poetic performativity, O'Hara's poetry straddles both the ontic and the ontological with equal significance, directing the reader's attention towards the impossibility of singular living in modern society, as well as the infinite potential of the assemblage promised by the shifting contours of the hyperscape. Thank you. Hi, Srinjoy, uh, I request to be fair to the participants. Uh, if you could just um, take a few more minutes and wrap it up then. Are you asking me to finish it? Just yes, yes. take a few more minutes. How long is it? It's fine. Oh, no, no, no. It's, oh uh, I've actually finished my paper, but you know, we could, I could take, you know, questions or anything oh, like that. Yeah? Thanks. I was looking for. Yeah, thanks. I actually stuck to time, so that's why. Yeah, no, no, you were, you were great. You were great uh, with time. You were, it was also a fantastic paper. 
Um, and uh, I don't see any uh, tight questions so far, but um, in, if, if somebody would like to speak right now. Uh, if the chair allows, we can take the questions at the end or for two papers or for all papers together. I think that's, that's fine. It also gives people some time to collect their thoughts and uh, sure. So let's then uh, move on to our next presentation, um, uh, which is by uh, Lakshmi. Um, is, just give me a second. Lakshmi, Lakshmi Menon, who um, is also a PhD uh, student um, in GNU. Um, and is also currently teaching um, uh, at, at VTM NSS College, Trivandrum. Um, so, um, Lakshmi, uh, hi. You like to start? You, uh, Lakshmi, yes. would speak on um, Unreal City and um, uh, expressions of Tokyo in video games. Um, so please, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I hope uh, I'm audible. And uh, okay, great. Thanks, ma'am. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Um, not so far, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, my paper is called Unreal City, Representations of Tokyo in Video Games. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, talking about a game that I'm actually not discussing in detail. Uh, this is Kingdom Hearts 3. It was released by Square Enix in 2019. Uh, it's a story of a young uh, Japanese animation -y boy, Sora, who travels around Disney worlds uh, with Donald and Goofy. And uh, basically, it's uh, an action adventure game. Uh, now, the one of the facts of this game is that uh, if you fulfill certain conditions by the end, you get a special video that kind of hints as to what's coming in uh, future games. Uh, so the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 has Sora waking up in this environment, uh, which is very clearly not a Disney world. Uh, so what happened is players immediately realized that this uh, is a very recognizable space. This is uh, Shibuya's um, scramble crossing, uh, this particular space. Uh, later, they, uh, the next uh, scene had uh, the deuteragonist of the series, Sora's friend Riku, waking up in this uh, environment, which again, players recognized to be a reference to Tokyo's metropolitan building. Uh, so what happened when uh, people recognize these spaces, uh, the purpose is obviously not to talk about the future of the Kingdom Hearts series. Instead, what we're going to look at is the fact that players of Kingdom Hearts 3 immediately recognized uh, Shibuya Crossing. And this is not significant in itself because uh, Shibuya Crossing is very uh, ubiquitous in, um, in, in media that involves Tokyo. For example, the film Lost in Translation or The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. What is important is that using certain key markers, players identified that the Shibuya that Sora is waking up in is not the actual Shibuya in Tokyo, but the Shibuya from another Square Enix game, uh, The World Ends With You. Uh, most significantly is the presence of the 104 building in the GIF that you see at the bottom and the original 109 building that exists in uh, actual Shibuya. Uh, not only that, uh, but players also used Sora's and Riku's and other characters' positions in uh, the ending video and kind of triangulated uh, the positions that they're, they're in in actual Tokyo and used this as possible clues for parsing where the games might uh, take the series and the characters henceforth. Uh, so it makes for an interesting mode of interpreting the game world uh, and provides, and this knowledge of real world Shibuya or real world Tokyo is providing players with the tools to possibly parse meanings behind the video. So as I said, we're not talking only about Kingdom Hearts, uh, but this secret video uh, serves to encapsulate certain basic ideas that this paper will be discussing. First, how does the video game city become real through inter player interaction with the game? Uh, specifically, since the paper looks at Tokyo, how much of the Tokyo in the games is actually Tokyo? Secondly, what are the semiotic markers that the games use to create the idea of Tokyo? And thirdly, how does interactivity and navigability function in the construction of the real Unreal City in video games. Basically, is Tokyo really Tokyo? How do you know it's Tokyo? And getting around Tokyo. Uh, so in applying sem semiotics to the creation of game worlds, we are attempting to point out that the signs that are being employed in order to create a fictional world, uh, or a, you know, a suitable lie, as Umberto Eco would put it, points uh, back to the truth of the real world that it represents. Uh, now, there are three games uh, when we're talking about is Tokyo really Tokyo? There are three games that I'm looking at. 
um, actually the third is a series of eight games, uh, Persona 5 by Atlas Games, uh, Square Enix's The World Ends With You, and Sega's uh, Yakuza series. Uh, and all of these uh, create creates its own version of Tokyo that while being recognizable through the use of, as I said, certain semiotic markers, it's also sufficiently different enough to make the city a real and a, a virtual unreal space. Uh, now, world, world building is one of the integral parts of uh, video game design. Uh, it's been described as everything that fleshes out the setting, uh, the sense of place in the games, and the sense of place in the games, resulting in the confluence of art and design. Uh, we are also talking about something that anybody who's worked with uh, game theory might be familiar with, which is the concept of the magic circle. The magic circle is pervasive in game studies, applicable to all spaces where games and indeed any kind of play occurs. It is not limited to physical spaces like uh, stadiums or even the layout of a board game, but extends to imaginary spaces. In the case of video games, the boundaries are strictly virtual, just as the magic circles themselves exist only on the screen. Uh, as Janet Murray says, when we enter a fictional world, we do not su merely suspend a critical faculty. We also exercise a creative faculty. Uh, we do not suspend disbelief as much as we actively create belief. Uh, in gamer theory, Walk distinguishes the difference between the real world and the illusory world of the video game, using the term game space to signify not the virtual world of the game, but the abstract principles on which the game is based. They encode the uh, principles upon which the decisions about the realness of this world can be decided. Therefore, when we talk about the construction of a virtual city, it is not limited to only the architecture of said city. Instead, we must also consider the city as a semiotic text and as a game space where certain principles of the game world are put into action. Uh, game design is fundamentally a process of world building. And uh, as I said, it uses a system of symbols to represent a view of reality. And the artist uh, who, who designs this world, um, this artist you, uh, shares his consciousness of aspects of that reality. Uh, in a video game, these signs are obviously the video, uh, audio visual assets that are used to construct the environment. However, it's not merely the use of these assets that establish a semiotic system. It is only when the player processes the signs that the meaning can be produced. Uh, these signs are important in that they represent the game world to the player and also the real world signifies connecting the physical spaces of a city to the virtual world. It is through player interaction with the game world that meaning is produced. So how do you know it's Tokyo or signifying Tokyo? Now, perhaps the most stylized version of Tokyo in the three games that we're examining uh, can be found in The World Ends With You. The game is set in a kind of mirror version of Shibuya, uh, where the, the protagonist Neku and his allies are trapped. Uh, and uh, many people have talked about how the, the Shibuya in The World Ends With You is very closely inspired by and is in fact very similar to uh, real world uh, Tokyo. Uh, but the, the aesthetic, as you can see, is very uh, different. The reason why the game's developers chose to set the game in Shibuya, first of all, is because of a desire to create a space that players could identify with. Uh, the district's uniqueness adds a certain reality and depth that we couldn't have recreated in a fantasy setting. And it lets players identify more with their in-game counterparts. Uh, but it's also not just the physical space of Shibuya that we're talking about. We're also talking about the culture of Shibuya, the youth culture, the art and the music, and even the combat is all inspired by the way that the city has been um, stylistically described. Uh, the game world therefore has been designed to create a Tokyo with a youthful attitude that is unfamiliar enough to be identifiable as an alternate version of the actual city. Uh, now the Tokyo of Persona 5 is created again, uh, is also very uh, different from the one that we've talked about. The protagonist of Persona 5 uh, is a young man who has been falsely accused of a crime and is sent to school in Tokyo as part of his uh, probation. Uh, the, now this Tokyo is created by, again, combining many semiotic layers together. Uh, and a person who is completely unfamiliar with these uh, semiotic layers or these signs would not be able to uh, parse the depth of the symbolism that is used to create the city nor appreciate its nuances. Uh, and this ability to parse the semiotic layers becomes necessary in order to proceed in some aspects of the gameplay uh, without the assistance of a guide or a walkthrough. Uh, for example, when the player is required to find a place where there's a shady bar uh, where you can exchange information with uh, a, and have a clandestine meeting, uh, a player who knows Tokyo at least uh, or has a basic idea of Tokyo would know that this would be possible in 
Shinjuku's Kabu Kabukicho, which is the infamous red light district of Tokyo. And in the game, it's characterized by this pink glow of multiple neon signs for love hotels and hostess clubs. Uh, now, the same Kabukicho is also the setting for Sega's Yakuza series of games and their spin offs. Uh, it, although in this case, it appears under the name Kamurocho. Kamurocho is a near faithful uh, recreation of this red light district, right down to the red neon lights of the entrance archway. But it's different in that locations that appear visually identical to their real world counterparts have different names and purposes. Uh, for example, as you can see in these slides. Now, semiotic codes are not only the are not the only way in which game spaces are created, as neither are the 3D renderings of physical space sufficient to make the space real. Uh, Diana Melnick suggests that storytelling plays as much of an inst instrumental role in the creation of these spaces as it does in other forms of texts, despite the fact that the experience of the game world is different from the experience of, for example, a film or a novel. This is because game spaces are explored by the player uh, through the player character, who has an actual relationship with this game world. The interactivity of games is their defining feature. It, it affects the distance between media users and media characters. Players either control uh, one specific character or take on a specific role um, uh, represented in the game world. Uh, now, game spaces are, as I said, not built only through audio and visual representations, but through the way, idea of storytelling. And this is clearest when you play a game like the Yakuza series, uh, because uh, they take place chronologically over a period from 1988 to 2018. And you can see how the changes in the city have taken place over this uh, span of all, over 30 years. And um, this is most clear in this particular area. If a, a player who is familiar with Kamrojo would know that uh, this is a this is a, an empty lot in the first game, Yakuza Zero, which later becomes the space for the Millennium Tower, which is uh, an area where, which is a location for many important plot beats in later games. So when Yakuza Zero, which actually it was released after many other games. Uh, when it first revealed that this key uh, plot of land is the location for the Millennium Tower, it was immediately noticeable to longtime players of the series who were familiar with the city within the game. Uh, so there's a kind of familiarity that players develop with the game space and the game city. And this uh, brings me to this next part of my paper, uh, which is getting around Tokyo or the production of game spaces, where I'm basically talking about Lefebvre's uh, spatial triad. So uh, Lefebvre's work has been uh, extensively used in game theory. And, he, and here we're talking about the spatial triad, uh, the, the idea of the conceived space, the lived space or representational space, and the perceived space or spatial practice. Um, and we're talking about each of these and how they uh, find, a, uh, find a kind of uh, parallel in video game uh, playing and video game design. Now, uh, when we're talking about conceived space, it's one that reinforces the hegemonic ideas of the ideas of hegemonic control through the establishment of certain fixed rules and expectations of outcome. Within the game world, these rules are part of the coding of the game. And uh, in each of these games, there, in any game, there are certain rules of behavior that one can find, uh, and the ways in which and the ways in which this game Tokyo obviously refers. Uh, differs from the real world Tokyo is where you can see the idea of conceived space appearing here. Uh, and uh, we can talk about many ways in which this occurs, but one of the most significant is the addition of a combat mechanic, because obviously a person, a layman visiting Tokyo would not be required to fight their way through the city. Uh, but in uh, each of these games, there is a combat mechanic. Uh, for example, in Kamurocho, there's a constant uh, existence of Yakuza thugs who want to beat you up for various reasons. Uh, in The World Ends With You, Shibuya, and the conflict is not immediately visible. Neku needs to scan an area in order to identify the enemy and engage them in combat. And engaging uh, people in combat in any of these games is necessary in order to progress the story and also uh, develop the player character. Uh, Persona 5 has Mementos, which is a dungeon, a multi-layer dungeon, which, um, ex which is based on the subway uh, of Tokyo and it's complete with tracks and station platforms. And what makes Mementos interesting is that it's very recognizably part of the city in that it takes the form of a subway network and it's also uh, literally representing the consciousness of Tokyo as a whole. Uh, so Lefavre says that spaces are designed to manipulate those who live inside them. And here the manipulation occurs in both the story text and in the way the space has been constructed. The Tokyo in each of these games plays an important role in the stories and ultimately a role in the outcome of the game. It's only through engaging with the conceived space 
that the game developers have put in place following the rules set out that one can fully succeed in the game. Um, there are also um, sub stories that I'll talk about in a minute. So uh, when you talk about representational or evocative spaces, we're talking about the clues in, in the game world that evoke shared knowledge. Um, the game Tokyo's add elements that deepen the layers of meaning in this representation. Uh, in exploring the game worlds in all three games, the player character often comes across sub stories or brief side quests uh, that ex explore the personalities of non player characters or satirize Japanese society or comment on aspects as diverse as transgender issues, toxic masculinity, the exploitive nature of the sex industry, or even contemporary Japanese politics. For example, here the protagonist. Uh, has a uh, has a point where he uh, has a conversation with a transgender uh, with a trans woman, and here we have in Persona Five we have a budding politician who you can befriend and eventually lead into uh, political success through your own actions. Uh, so, in addition to um, the cities being similar to the uh, real world Tokyo's, down to the networks of alleys and roads, the existence of a vibrant populace helps to create the lived space within the game world. Uh, here we also briefly uh, talk about the work of Yi Fu Tuan, uh, who talks about space as the emotional ties that are created between people and place through the repetition of routines. Uh, spaces and representations that appear in the games obtain new layers of meaning when encountered within the game world, and these encounters in the game world simultaneously enhance the meaning of their real world counterparts. Um, Okay, uh, Lefavre's idea of perceived space refers to the initiatives and directions that are created by the inhabitants of a space. In gameplay, this forms a direct relation uh, to the player's experience, which, and I quote, embraces production and, rep uh, and reproduction and particular spatial set characteristic of each social formation. Uh, and here again, we can come to um, you, uh, Yuan's idea of topophilia, where players in also invest personalized stories and meanings into the world. So much does this occur that sometimes it is difficult for players to differentiate between the existence of the game world and the actual world. And uh, here's where I talk about the sequel to The World Ends With You called Neo The World Ends With You. And this is the social media fallout uh, for, for the trailer for that game, in which many players of Persona 5 directly imagined that the Neo World, The World Ends With You was a ripoff of Persona 5 only because of the presence of Shibuya in both games. And that's literally the only thing that uh, actually uh, is the only similarity between them. Uh, and this is because Shibuya has become so real in the minds of players as a location in Persona 5 and not as an actual part of the city of Tokyo. Uh, and this suggests that the reality of Tokyo for many players is mm -hmm. forgotten. Sorry to interrupt you, Lakshmi. You uh, have less than a minute. Please try yeah, to I'm wrap done. up. Really I'm done. Sorry. I'm like at the end. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> tada, the conclusion. Yeah, so, uh, this is where we're talking about uh, the virtual uh, Tokyo. So it cannot be denied that there's a very real possibility, of course, that there's a kind of techno orientalism in the way that the game Tokyos are being created. And that's because this, these Tokyos are simultaneously rooted in both Eastern and Western imagination. Uh, this is similar to the Tokyos that you see in anime and manga and other uh, Japanese popular culture. And that's the image of Japan that the West has grown used to seeing, uh, which is um, sufficiently different enough to make it uh, you know, which is both, you know, it, it's both recognizable and yet sufficiently different to make it a virtual and unreal space. And these spaces often exist only when they're interacted by the player in the video game space. So as the player interprets the semiotic structures of the ludic Tokyos in order to interact with them through in-game acts such as rescuing damsels in distress, spending time playing golf, or simply walking the bustling streets, the environments that they explore become as real as the ones out in the outside of the virtual world. So just like the tourist who visits foreign lands and imagines oneself reinvented, the game player through traveling into the game world often undergoes a rediscovery of identity in relation to the game world. I'm back. Thank Great. you, Lakshmi. Um, we have a few questions and uh, I'm informed that you would be leaving soon after your paper. So the questions, okay. would you like them here or uh, shall we mail them to you? Uh, I can look at, yeah, I can see a lot of questions here. Yeah, I can take the questions. I think I have the time for that. Yeah, I'm good. If we're not running so too late. The, uh, with the permission of the chair, shall I put yeah, the chair now? Okay. Sure, sure. Um, uh, absolutely. We, uh, we don't have too much time, uh, yeah. but yeah, uh, maybe a couple of minutes. Great paper, huh, Lakshmi, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks. thanks, I just ran uh, through the end of it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thanks for injecting some fun into our afternoon. <laughs> 
a question of my own, but I shall uh, mail it to you later, Lakshmi. I'm going to read the question uh, together, okay. and then you can answer them. So, uh, beginning with the most recent, Diksha Yadav uh, asked that Lefebvre, as well as one, gives importance to lived experiences of the inhabitants, as well as the ones, uh, as well as the ones connection with the community in what goes into the making of the city. How does that play out in a simulated space of game? wherein one needs to engage with the characters embedded in the game momentarily and the move forward. Okay, and yeah. Can, uh, Nikhil, uh, yeah, let's, I'll, let's I'll listen to all of them, maybe, and, yeah. Anushka Nikhil Singh, uh, I've been to Shibuya, but yes, if I hadn't too, would only see it as part of a video game location. Japan is already pretty romanticized in the eyes of most people, based purely on fiction. I think it's a comment she's making. She has already asked yeah. that question earlier. Uh, I'll read that out too. Mohit is asking, are these conceived spaces in gaming worlds from Japan in some ways attempting to put forward a kind of resistance to the capitalist and neoliberal model, mm -hmm. the way Cyberpunk 2077 by CD Projekt is trying to do? Would like to know your opinion on this since you have worked so extensively on Japanese gaming culture. So uh, Anushka Nikhil asked this question earlier, she said. Video games with such detailed recreations of the real world are so helpful when we are all stuck inside, but it won't ever be the same. Do you think this is a good development for people who struggle to go out, who have agoraphobia or social anxiety, or does it just enable them? Okay, I'm going to take Anushka's question first because it's the easiest to answer. Uh, this paper is actually the result of uh, the 10 month lockdown that we had where I played all seven Yakuza games and became very obsessed with this idea of Tokyo as a virtual space. Uh, and it, it's, it's very interesting because, um, and this actually brings me to also the question about, uh, you know, uh, making connections with the community and the ex lived experiences of the inhabitants uh, because, uh, and if you do this, if you do play a series like the Yakuza games, what happens is that the city actually becomes very real, especially Kamurocho as it exists, becomes very real to you. And yes, um, you know, this kind of uh, lived experience is obviously very limited in the space of a game because you're not going to uh, spend beyond the, the span of like 60 hours of gameplay, maybe at the max. Uh, so definitely in the sp uh, simulated space of games where you do need to uh, engage with them, uh, there are certain characters who do live on and, you know, in Japanese gaming, popularity of characters becomes a very important thing. And you do have recurring characters and multi game story arcs. So, uh, you know, the city itself becomes a, a character in the game. So it's, it's a much longer answer that I want to give, especially reg in, in regards to Lafavre and Tuan. But uh, maybe I can get in touch with you guys. Uh, outside when we don't have such a time constraint. And this is why, why virtual conferences are so sad. Um, because yeah, this, the question about cyberpunk and uh, you know, I do think uh, that it's uh, these uh, games and these spaces. Uh, see, the thing about Japanese games is that they're not really looking to uh, compete with Western games as much as they are with uh, their own audiences. And you'll see how certain games do really well in Japan. And those are usually the Japanese games or the games set in Japan. So the, uh, for example, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which came out last year, is extremely popular in Japan because even though it's a Japanese, it's a game set in Japan, but made by a Western uh, company. However, games like the Assassin's Creed series, which are so popular worldwide, don't do as well in Japan for various reasons, including censorship. Uh, so yeah, uh, cyber. I have a whole other like cyberpunk for me is a whole other kettle of fish because there's a lot of uh, strangely orientalist uh, things happening in that narrative. So uh, Mohit, again, uh, we can talk about this uh, maybe later because yeah, cyberpunk as you might know if you're familiar with it, you know what's happening with cyberpunk anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'd love right. to talk to you about it later as well. So. Sure. <laughs> Okay, so I, I know that there's uh, like a hurry and it's not just my hurry, but we do have other people to present. But yeah, oh, good, here's another question. Um, I, I think maybe you could uh, take it later. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you can mail me or WhatsApp I'm me so sorry, can I just interrupt? Uh, no, no, Skitty, can I interrupt with your permission? Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, Lakshmi, what I would suggest is that, uh, you know, you can respond to the messages in the chat so that, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, while others are presenting, you can still answer. Sure. And sure, my sure. request to all the presenters is we really want to hear Stuti speak and also, you know, I mean, I'm sure all of yeah. you are presenting to get a response from others. So please don't take up all the 20 minutes minutes for presentation please keep your presentation to 15 minutes so that we can have some time for chatting you know that's yeah what we are I, I actually yeah to. I practiced yesterday and I thought I, I know, cut I know, it short I know, I know. that's fine that's fine that's fine okay 
sorry. I'm sorry for intervening. No, no, that's fine. Okay. So yeah, I'll do that. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Lakshmi. And um, we'll move on now to uh, Namita Paul, um, who has been teaching in DU for a number of years. She's been teaching since 2004. Um, and she's, um, uh, uh, she did her MPhil from, uh, from Delhi University. She's currently teaching in Kamla Nehru College. Um, Namita will talk to us today about um, the, the web series Made in Heaven. Um, intersectionality and hyper aesthetics in the making of Delhi and the Dilli Wala. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Uh, yes, Namita. Okay, okay. So I'll just plunge into the paper. Um, Zoya Akhtar and Reema Kakti's Amazon Prime video series, uh, Made in Heaven, deconstructs the popular trope of the great Indian wedding to focus on the socio-political realities of its characters. This work will examine the series through a lens of intersectionality, queer theory, and phenomenological modes to explore the construction and circulation of identity, representation, and gender relations with an emphasis on non-heteronormative uh, sexuality. A large part of the essay will look at the fashioning of a particular vision of the city of Delhi and its intertwining with the prominence given to hyper-aesthetic cultures. The paper will then illustrate how the screen explodes with the familiar grandeur of the elite Dilliwala's wedding ceremonies that combine the influence of an increasingly globalized urban transnational identity with traditional and often patriarchal and heteronormative local cultures. The importance of creating non-heteronormative alliances, which are highlighted in the text, will be discussed in the concluding part of the paper. The series features Tara Khanna and Karan Mehra, who struggle with their identities in a hegemonic milieu that is marred by patriarchy, homophobia, elitism, class divisions, caste prejudice, ageism, and superstition. Both characters are business partners who run a wedding planning company together in New Delhi, and every episode has a different wedding that takes the narratives of the lead characters forward and intertwines it with the critique of the structures that seek to essentialize and subjugate identities through a nexus between the capitalist technocratic complex and regressive attitudes. The familiar Bollywood trope of the big fat Indian wedding is defamiliarized to reveal the darkness behind the glitter. The foregrounding of the competitive wedding business in a series titled Made in Heaven sets the ironic tone uh, for, the, uh, for the series that will highlight the complexities of a globalized, seemingly urbane city landscape that is still hemmed in by its tribalization. Young women from privileged backgrounds recreate carefully choreographed dances while being subjected to purity investigations, while others take loans to pay for expensive videos for their social media platforms to keep up appearances. In a particularly pertinent episode of a young woman marrying into a royal family um, uh, who is hailed publicly as the first female pilot uh, um, in the family, yet she works to suppress the sexual assault perpetrated by her father-in-law to protect uh, the honor of the family. Subjectivities are represented through the hypocrisies of the elite whose public personas are in sharp contrast to their private lives. This dualism is not a celebration of a seemingly comfortable plurality, which is often the case in uh, more mainstream films of Bollywood directors like Karan Johar and Suraj Bhajatya, but instead a hard look at the duplicity of existing in the contemporary world. A turn towards a post-human world where digital representations of the self take precedence over other kinds of construction of identity seems to be the norm for many of the characters in this series. The fluidity of the digital space allows some characters to rebuild and protect their positions. In the episode titled Starstruck Lovers, a damning photograph of a young bride kissing a celebrity Bollywood star threatens the impending wedding ceremony and the joint venture planned by the families of the young couple. Even more dangerous are the systems of surveillance in the hotel, which capture Harsimran going into Sarfaraz's room in the evening. The photograph of the two goes viral on social media, creating the image of an unfaithful and non-traditional bride. The CCTV footage is easily removed by Tara and Karan, who use their position to do so without telling the group. But the damage done to the bride's reputation can only be resolved by creating a counter narrative of a pious bride who is skilled in the art of cooking. The bride with a transnational upbringing cooks for the first time in her life 
performing for the camera to ensure that a new version of her identity is created in social media. The ruse works, even though she is racked by guilt and she reacts by vomiting on seeing the digital image of the pious innocent bride that has been created by the wedding planners. Karan reassures her by asking her to forget her physical reality and by embracing the digital image of herself that will ensure the integrity of her marriage. The format of the series also gives the creators the liberty to focus on constructing the idea of Delhi as a mega city, its urbanization offering its large population a multitude of opportunities. The capital city glistens with the chandeliers, jewels and, ma and manicured gardens of the rich Delhi elite who live in sprawling homes as new age royalty. Made in Heaven also shows us the other side of the city as a site of traffic congestion, urban planning failures, unemployment, corruption, and drug abuse. The historical significance of the city is subtly invoked in It's Never Too Late when the wedding of an older couple is planned in the ruins of a haveli located in the bylanes of Old Delhi. The grace and elegance of the older couple whose wedding is seen as a social embarrassment by their grown children is reflected in the old world charm of the Haveli, which transforms into a venue replete with silks and kavalis. Delhi's position as a globalized city with wealthy citizens who are familiar with international taste is emphasized with the bride's insistence on serving only the noble grapes and champagne at her wedding. Since the city offers the chance to climb up the social ladder, we have a wedding planner like Tara, who does not understand what the noble grapes are, but uh, she texts her friend Feza to find out that they are the red wines of Bordeaux. Networks and connections play an important role in this version of Delhi. And we see how the wealthy Adil uses his uh, family connections and bribes to bail out Karan. And Jazz uses her knowledge of the underbelly of the city to find her drug addicted brother. Perhaps the most infamous citizens of uh, Delhi are the politicians who call the capital their home. We encounter the powerful political clan of the Yadavs in the last episode of The Great Escape with their rambling bungalow in Lutyens, Delhi. Ensconced within its security detail are their political ambitions and their surviving daughter who is being forced into a marriage of political convenience by her father. As she escapes the clutches of her powerful family, it's the most marginalized res residents of the Indian megacity, the Hijras, who help her by in enveloping her in their boisterous celebration. The diversity of the city is invoked in Tried and Bridezilla, where an entitled bride demands Delhi feels for her music video, pushing her father to take a loan to finance the wedding. Parallel to this is the story of Khalil, the representative blue collar worker uh, in the Made in Heaven office, who asks Tara for a loan for his daughter's wedding. She contemplates his request and offers to organize a wedding instead as a gift from the company, a celebration which takes her back again uh, to the streets of Old Delhi and the sense of community, memory and history that it invokes in her. The city is in sharp contrast to the affluent and cold geographies inhabited by Adil's family, the Khannas, where family members communicate with each other by using intercoms and infidelities are compensated for by jewelry. Delhi is projected as a city where your address determines your social rank. Lutyens Delhi means par, while the farmhouses of South Delhi signify affluence. The city's edges, Dwarka and Rohini, become the spaces that jazz yearns to escape while Old Delhi both pulls and repels Tara. Recognizable landmarks like Delhi Hat and Khan Market make several appearances in the series, marking their presence as an arty organic hub and fashionable shopping paradise for the well-heeled respectively. The narrative of the city is often shaped by the voiceovers of Kabir, who dissects the promises and dangers of the city, just as he comments on the transactional nature of Indian weddings. The idea of Delhi is also fashioned by comparing and con contrasting it with cities located nearby. Karan is forced to plan a wedding in Ludhiana, where the groom's family conducts a pageant to select the best bride for, her NR for their NRI son. The fast and easy display of money and a drug-fueled pre-wedding celebration for the men is viewed by the wedding planners as a step down uh, from the grand weddings that they conduct in Delhi. In a different episode, Adil and Feza's holiday in Jaipur ends with an accident that reveals their affair to everyone. These other cities become the foil to the primary object of scrutiny, Delhi. However, this vision uh, of the city with its loud and obnoxious Dilliwalas, the pervasive classicism,
the retrograde attitudes, peppered with references to its history, is a vision that also omits major aspects of the culture and geography of Delhi. So whose vis vision is it? Is it Bollywood's version of Delhi as alleged by critics or are the creators uh, using the stories as part of a world making process to create a version of the city that helps us to understand experiences, people and events that surround us. The world of Made in Heaven is not concerned with creating an authentic replica of Delhi. Instead, it creates a simulation of the capital that fills the screen with its hyper aesthetics. The first shot of the show is a close-up of Tara pouting into her compact mirror and painting her lips with bright red lipstick. The camera pans out to reveal the backdrop, which has a sepia-tinted portrait of an opulent courtesan handing on, uh, hanging on the walls of her extravagant office. Various characters comment on the lavishness of the office and they are reminded repeatedly that the wedding business requires this aesthetic of overabundance. The opening credits of the series similarly create a montage of elaborate ceremonies, signs and experiences associated with weddings like roses, candles, beaches, palaces and fairy tale costumes. Every wedding in the series is staged using larger than life decor and focusing on and focuses on satisfying every sensory uh, experience. This focus on the gratification of the senses is cultural and political, pointing to the privilege of the upper classes and the aspirations of all others. Even the daughter of the working class Khalil wants a tall wedding cake whose images she has seen only in magazines. Brides scream and cry over the flowers that they want for their wedding, while others insist on more gold for the theme. The sensory world of the series is complex as the gold, wine, flowers, and branded costumes are juxtaposed with shots of brides vomiting, disarrayed hotel rooms, and guests overdosing on drugs. After Karan spent some time in jail, he hobbles out saying that he is filthy, but is quickly embraced by Tara who says that it does not matter. Jazz finds her brother in a public park left powerless by the drugs in his system, and Tara's former home is described as a gutter multiple times in the narrative. These images of abjection uh, work within the context of hyper aesthetics, providing the senses a connection with the others in Delhi who exist in its shadows. After all, it is connection that the characters yearn for. In the case of Tara, they take on the form of economic and social connections that she builds by strategically using her body and images of it with Adil. Their friend Feza longs for acceptance from her patriarchal father, but finds it instead in her relationship with Adil. Karan longs for a family and society that will embrace his true identity as a young gay man without mocking or bullying him. This is why the alliance that is forged between Tara and Karan becomes the primary relationship in the series that offers the opportunity for transformation for both the characters. The contours of their non-heteronormative friendship uh, with each is unique for Indian screens with its reliance on honesty and emotionality. Both characters reveal their vulnerability to the other with the knowledge that their flaws and failings will be accepted without judgment. This alliance allows them both to break free from the societal norms and traumas of their past misdemeanors that shackle them. Tara walks out of her marital home and Karan rekindles his romance with his lover from school Nawab, who he has outed in order to protect himself from bullying in school. The series concludes its first season by showing the destruction and vandalization of their hitherto ostentatious office, caused perhaps by a right wing mob. In spite of the damage, both Tara and Karan uh, find refuge with each other in the space that they have built together. This denouement shifts the focus from the traditional idea of the family and the family home that is otherwise portrayed as a space of love, acceptance, and connection to this extraordinary alliance formed by two outsiders in the city. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Namita. Um, that was a very nice sort of mapping out of the city, you know, through the lens of uh, through the lens of this show. Um, I see that there are a couple of questions for you. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time, but maybe you could uh, try and address at least one of them um, as as you know briefly as you can. 
and then perhaps you could continue the conversation over over the chat uh, function yes so i think mohit has asked uh, i would like to ask how these new ott platforms are providing a space uh, which is liberating certain kinds of gender performatives which are mostly limited in mainstream bollywood movies after all it is tara who records her video yes um, that's true um, see these ott platforms one of the reason why that they are able to uh, delve into uh, some of these topics and uh, look at performative in such an extended uh, way one is because of the format because it's a long format it's not a short film and secondly because censorship right now for them is a very different ball game uh, though it is changing as we speak you know over the past year uh, ott platforms um, have been bought on the under the ambit of the inb ministry till now uh, yeah. they were working through a self regulatory court um however that has been rejected uh, by the government and they have been bought under uh, the inb ministry which means that uh, more often than not they will be asked to curtail certain uh, certain kinds of narratives and to be careful about uh, what is being shown on uh, on the screen of course the argument against this that the ott uh, platforms and the makers are constantly um uh, giving for um so for for saying that you know they should not be bought in, under the ambit of these regulatory bodies is that uh, one uh, these are uh, works that are screened online uh, right that are streamed online uh, using the internet and they are meant for private viewing it's not broadcast um so they should have the space to to look at um, you know alternative um, and and perhaps much more transgressive kinds of narratives so uh, the others perhaps later or in the chat box right okay well thank you uh, thank you for that namita thank, uh, thank you and um, we move now um, to the final speaker in the session who is um, who is our uh, very own mohit abrol um, um, from uh, iit he's um, he's he's doing his phd um, um, here with us um, and uh, he's particularly sort of working on bergson's uh, influence on eliot um so um over to you uh, mohit um, sure. i'm just going to share my screen yeah. okay all right i hope you can hear me and my screen is also visible to everyone yes it is all right great so my title is basically interrogating urban and political cartographies in delhi through sanan banerjee's corridor and vishwajyot ghosh vishwajyot ghosh delhi ka okay now uh, in recent times representations of urban spaces as constituted by two way process of socio spatial dialectic which is edward ojas term where the city inhabitants simultaneously shape and were getting conditioned by the ongoing processes of urbanization has witnessed a growing interest in urban sociology and city writings to outline the human and non human agents have come very close to each other okay so according to neil brenner and i'm not going to read the uh, quotes which are there in the slide it's for everyone to see because there is less time according to neil brenner until very recently the epistemological bedrock for entire field of urban studies was based on the assumption that city is to be perceived as a bounded territorial area whose specificity lies in being very distinct from the other the areas which are differently configured spatially socially ecologically and lay beyond the city boundaries what apadurai and mendieta's imaginative and phenomenological approaches have done is to interrogate this horizontal cartography which lies behind this urban question their approaches have very defined political implications in the sense of belonging and distance within the city scapes it has further sharpened the aristotelian formation or formulation of zoo politicon the political animal that our potentiality for humanity is only actualized between or within the polis so this potentiality is a very important term right now because of the ongoing discussion which has been happening between lefer on one hand and apadurai and mendieta because he is trying to come up with this philosophy of city itself and this potentiality introduces a new element into the functional dimension of urban design and architecture which typically takes into consideration the geometrical coordinates 
to map city spaces. Now it introduces what Norbul Schulz has called existential space, which comprises of man's relationship with his environment. Because following Mendiata's approach, the city implies more than a shelter. Now it is seen under the lens of a dwelling place, borrowing a very important trope from Heidegger. And uh, the new cartographic models suggest, as the quotes try to point out, uh, that city is not a concretized version of spatial distribution and dimensions, but a multitude. It has a geist, it has a spirit in qualitative terms as Heidegger uses to characterize earth and sky in Hebel, the Ausfront, which is the quote I'm going to read. It's not in the slide. The single houses, the villages, the towns are workings of building within which within round themselves gather the multifarious in between. This in betweenness is going to be talked about when I'm going to discuss the two graphic moments as well. The buildings bring the earth as the inhabited landscape close to man, and at the same time places the closeness of neighborly dwelling under the expanse of sky. So the city in the phenomenological sense is being understood in spatial terms, but also in the sense what this spatiality tries to convey to us, the city inhabitants the embodied beings which find themselves located in the triangular relationship between A, meaning making, B, the object or place which represents or carries this thing, which is the city, and C, the subject or the city dweller who is experiencing it. So now this is the diagram which uh, Lakshmi also had tried to show, which is about conceived space and perceived space, space which um, emerges very strongly in the production of space by Leffer. The convergence of Apadurai's social practices in the recognition of imagination and Lefebvre's spatial practices and political economy, which Mendieta attempts, serves as a gestural act to get the look of the city. And while at the same time, it is an act of looking into the city. So as Mendieta states, philosophy is always the work of an image of the city, the imagination of the city and the social imaginary of a demos. Conversely, the city is produced by philosophy in so far as philosophy offers an imagine of the city, calls for a particular urban imagination and determine the frontiers of a social imaginary that it either excludes or includes the city as its locus." Lefebvre's account of what constitutes social space is primarily based on those who pass through it. So it's a power relation which is being played out within a spatial field. And whenever there's a struggle, the struggle happens always somewhere. So it is localized, it is located somewhere. So Lefebvre's suggestion that there is politics, and I'm quoting, which is a very important line coming from Lefebvre's works, which is, there is a politics of space because space is political becomes more attuned when we try to bridge Upper Dura and Mendiata together, becomes more attuned to the embodied experience because now the urban phenomena is characterized or given a special significance through the human body. The new cartographical imaginary argues that yes, there is a politics of space, but not simply because there are political disputes over space, rather that space and spatial terms cannot be understood without a political context. The sensory deprivation, which Richard Sennett talks about in this very interesting book, Flesh and Stone, The Body and City in Western Civilization, uh, which he tries to associate, the sensory deprivation that he tries to associate with modern architecture is essentially contrapuntal and antithetical to Lefebvre's advocacy of perceptual psychology and gestalt theory in understanding the city or the experience of city dwellers that falls under Mendieta's phenomenology from below analysis. The city then is an interdisciplinary platform where various multiplicities and indeterminacies unfold. City functions at what Deleuze and Guthari characterized as an assemblage where new identities are generated through connections. Within this context, the city cannot be simply reduced to the aggregate properties of its parts since it is characterized by connections and capacities. The city includes heterogeneous human slash non-human, organic slash non-organic and technical slash natural elements which are very distinctly shown in Sanat Banerjee's corridor and Vishwajyoti Ghosh's Delika. Following Mendyatha's phenomenological approach to conceptualize the world or imagine the world the way we conceptualize humans, I'm going to offer some ways in which the two graphic novels, Corridor and Delika, interrogate the urban and political cartographies of Delhi, 
and in the process provide a frame where the views on the logical and when the others and logical approaches converge now for it is the comic which connects the cultural imperative of perceptual change that leferb argues about and the and the constantly morphing assemblages which we see in the lucent paper that are products of this logic which are put together in the experience of topological urban space that is there for the reader it is the comic which provides the image of the world to use heideggerian framework by presenting us with bodies moving which are moving and conceptualized through time and space the tangible actuality of images embodied within a frame and its luminous potentiality represents very vividly the urban issues of spacing emergence limits and betweenness and this specific issue of urban you know limitations and spacing emerges very strongly in what the lewis characterizes as high city which is basically here and now which is thisness so this kind of a paradigm where you have graphic novels where you have frames and they, these frames have embodied beings in them and they are very much colorful also or they can be black and white as well it has certain kind of a thickness it adds on to the space it adds on to that embodied experience within the city so that that's the way it becomes a meta narrative in many ways so the city in banerjee's corridor and that's the whole description of high city i don't have enough time to read it but nonetheless i'm going to move on to the next one so city walk is a place that everybody in delhi is familiar with so that's where the title uh, the city in banerjee's corridor is depicted as a network of implicit relations from which the subject is always already ensnared bego saying the protagonist of corridor who is shown in frame 1 is placed slash located in delhi and it is this very location which defines his experience so delhi's extreme heat can bring about mutations in human dna which is visible in frame 2 the very substance which biologically suffices as the ground for our ontological being in banerjee's corridor every encounter between the city and inhabitant is an event it is characterized as an event a meeting of singularities of countless elements in relative motions of speed and slowness and capacities to affect and get affected we witness a double becoming in which each body is altered and composed and decomposed producing something between them that is neither one nor the other something else entirely that cannot even be thought and there are certain scenes there are certain frames in this specific graphic novel where there are certain uh, characters who are followed by certain stalkers and there is very threatening look into their eyes and you know those frames do not really have a dialogue those frames try to show some kind of a regress into the past where the person has felt threatened because of some family member while growing up uh, moving to the next one so delhi is presented as a montage of urban recollections at stake is not the flow of images as they go on from one frame to another and look at the framing as well all the frames are not similar all right so there's a difference in the proportions which appears and disappears instantaneously but the traces of the past which will continue to remain in the urban space the retired tongewala who sits in the very first frame who eats breakfast with his horse from a seemingly empty plate presents himself as the suffering subject who forms an empathetic identification with his city life it makes us the readers feel in our bones the vulnerable spaces that inhabitants in delhi have come to occupy at the same time the elaborate breakfast ritual near jama masjid is about to begin but there are hardly any people to be seen the time of morning azan in the next frame signals a change in daylight and david hobby's paradigmatic ruminations about the right to city emerges very strongly in these frames because these poor and immigrants or migrants do not really have the right to determine their own existence within the embodied space that they have in delhi this makes one wonder whether the reasons behind their deprivation have not only an urban but a political element as well because all these frames show these inhabitants with a skull cap the most evident marker of a muslim identity in the lanes of old delhi The next two frames explore instances of heterosexual romance and conjugality in Delhi, where sexual happening is being described not through words but through gestures, and here the gestural acts come very strongly, which is in line with the experience that Apadurai and Mendieta have tried to sketch for us. The frames draw on the capacities for affecting and being affected in the immediate physical resonances of drawn bodies. 
the texture of the emotional and social interactions of characters and the gestalt of the composition on the pages. The protagonists speak of self only by virtue of these myriad experiences that the city of Delhi provides to him. The olfactory dance of these two moving bodies on the right hand side and the performative gestures constitute, as Elizabeth Grover states, a sexualized territory, the space that is one's own in which one can enact sexual seduction, extract sexual satisfaction, and intensify sexual forces." Unquote. The olfactory appeal and sensory fabrication of space is metastasized to the level of city itself in Vishwajyoti Ghosh's Devi Kam, where Delhi is accorded an actual character frame at the end of the novel where the other characters are being described. So this is the first one. All right. So Delhi is shown as one of the characters in the book. And Delhi's primordial appeal emerges on Delhi streets where one gets to hear the oft-repeated phrase, as you can see on the second side or the, you know, the other side, so to speak. Do you know who I am? You know, the phrase which is being heard by you know, so many people. Followed by a variety of curse words with loaded connotations. These verbal gyrations, just like the color shading inside the frames, Thicken the space, for it is here, which is captured as thisness or high city by the image in a graphic novel, that we enter into a relationship with the rest of Delhi. The olfactory appeal of traveling in Delhi reemerges with many political undertones in this one, okay, undertones to embody the experience of emergency in the next frames. Ghosh writes, and I'm going to just read the part which is below this first frame. Delhi has never been so unsure of its breadth as in the recent past. Mind your breath, mind your step, mind your words. Slowly let the silence in the buses convert to whispers, careful but free. Let democracy appear democratic." Unquote. So these bodies, and this is the final one. So these bodies as city dwellers and their narrative gestures, which precede the presence of a formal characterization, because in both the books you get to see Delhi first, and then you uh, see certain characters emerging in the book in the graphic novel are conveying something to us. So what is the whole message that these graphic novels are trying to convey to the audience as far as urban phenomena are concerned? They are trying to circulate a set of ethical and philosophical principles which simultaneously exist in the story world and in the city of Delhi. That Delhi is a city of shortcuts which is being described in first frame and who would like to live here forever anyway, which is the last refrain on the second uh, you know, frame. Uh, are instances of rhizomatic connectivities, which condition us and continue to act in an iterative logic till the character's life itself comes to an end. It shows that Delhi is constituted through the act of collective imagination, which encompasses interconnected and embodied processes. However, it is at the same time, and this links it to the title, which is an alchemy of an unloved city. However, it is at the same time that this processual composition of Delhi, the heterogeneity of its urban fabric, limits its claim to be a full-fledged city in true sense, the way Mumbai or Calcutta is. Within the weight of its mythical reputation as a place which has witnessed the fall and decline of many empires, Delhi is perceived as Percival Spear called it a stop-go space, which is narrowly obedient to the political history of the moment. In this sense, Delhi is an unloved city, and I believe many others approach orients us towards an ethics of care Another important Heideggerian uh, understanding where the city dweller can begin to critically reflect on his dwelling place. And, uh, you know, so that's the end of the presentation. And this is the book I think everybody can see. So this is a new book which has come out, Thomas Crowley, who really tries to talk about this ethics of care as well as Delhi is concerned. So the title itself is very, very beautifully um, written on the book, The Fractured Forest and Quad Size City. All right. So what exactly is happening around the ridge area? Because for a lot of Delhi University students, you know, that ridge, um, you know, brings a lot of different memories as they are you know, finishing their graduation and post-graduation from that place. All right. So that's the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mumit, also for, um, you know, also for a great presentation, of course, but also for staying, um, you know, keeping to time. Yeah. So we, uh, well, we officially have one minute left for okay. the discussion, but um, I, I don't think too many of us would mind if we, if we took a couple of minutes. Um, yeah. Um, 
just one one quick clarification with the, the the last slide the alchemy of an unloved city unloved city yeah that's, uh, that's that's the name of a book by emma tarlow right uh no there's a work which has been done by dupont jean luc dupont this uh, scholar this french scholar is associated with the french embassy and it's basically uh, the introduction to the selected essays that he had published in 2000 the alchemy of an unloved city that's right, right. and, so, and uh, yeah. so yeah and 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 emma you're right I, I, you're right and emma tarlo is sort of a co 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 writer co editor of that uh, i think so yes yes, yeah. yes. so this is a, yeah it's a compilation of essays it's a on, compilation of essays yeah that's good, right right i yeah. you know just just wondered why why that was that sounded so familiar yeah so um um, while you know questions uh, come up for um, for Mohit, um, just as a, I mean, I think it's it's been a wonderful panel. Uh, we've had uh, uh, you know we've been taken to a range of geographies, um, uh, Tokyo and uh, um, Delhi, New York. But more interestingly, um, you know, it's it's taken us across a range of. Um, spatial arrangements, uh, right? spatial organizations of the urban, um, which are, you know, not 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 limited uh, to, you know, to, to the material city. Um, right? We've looked at um, we've looked at hyperscapes and um, digital narratives, game space, um, graphic novels. Um, right? So it's um, Lakshmi's paper sort of made me think of. Um, Reading, reading Ulysses, reading Joyce as a, uh, you know, as 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 a game, uh, you know, in exploring the city of Dublin through the novel, is, uh, you know, kind of very similar to, you know, what what she was talking about um, in the game space. So um, it had a um, had a um, small um, a question, and if if I could use my you know, <laughs> use my privilege as chair to. Um, to to ask um, uh, Shrinjoy, um, you know, um, whose who's, um, wonderful paper, um, you know, uh, so I, I, I actually haven't, um, I'm not familiar with the poet um, you were referring to, but but so much of what you had to say, um, uh, you know, about uh, about the way his poetry kind of negotiates the this sort of this this uh, uh, incongruous kind of reality, right? The, the, the disarticulated sort of urban space of New York. Um, and, and, and the book it brought to mind to me, for me, was um, was Teju Kohl's um, Open City, right? Which is, which is also a, a New York book, which is also about walking, which is also about the flaneur um, confronting um, a, 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 a very layered, a very palimpsestic um, sort of city space that is both um, helping to consolidate his identity, but is also uh, sort of breaking it up, um, right? It, it, it's also kind of dismantling him um, as it were. So I, I wondered in terms of, you know, in speaking in terms of genre, I mean, is are there things that a poetic negotiation with city space um, is able to do um, that you know falls outside the ambit of um, of of fiction, or or vice versa. I mean, is is is, is it something you've ever thought about? Or yeah, so uh, you know um, that's actually a very um, you know astute observation because um, that's exactly what O'Hara does. He creates the palimpsest, and often what happens in his poetry in terms of genre, literally, a lot of his walking poems are actually written as if, you know, the words are sort of, you know, like E. Cummings would often do with his poetry, uh, that kind of images sort of thing where he's, you know, you see the words sort of walking on the page, right? I couldn't really present all of that because, uh, you know, because of paucity of time, but that's exactly what O'Hara does. And it, and you feel like uh, when, for instance, he's talking about, you know, he's at Times Square and, you know, he's reading poems, etc. You feel in the form itself 
that you are moving with O'Hara to Times Square and you feel that, you know, the, the, the space of the city is actually the space of poetry. So, uh, you know, it's not like he actually forces you to visualize. You kind of, you know, almost, you know, someone I was when I was discussing O'Hara's poetry, they said he kind of holds your hand and says that, you know, why don't you sort of come with me uh, inside the city? So I think uh, that's exactly what he does. And he kind of defies genre all the time because um, a lot of his poetry, um, 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 for instance, uh, Autobiographia Literaria, it actually just parodies everything that has happened before. And you know, when he says personism, a manifesto, etc., he's basically making fun of the fact that you would expect me to stick to a particular genre. If I'm coming from the New York school, you would want me to be, uh, you know, to talk about uh, paintings, you want me to talk about uh, art and dance and all of that. But the moment I kind of, you know, the problem is with O'Hara, the moment you try to fix him, that, you know, this is the genre that he likes, or this is the way he writes his poetry, he immediately sort of, um, you know, challenges that at the very same moment. So, uh, yeah, you're right. In that sense, you know, the poetic body itself is quite a lot like a palimpsest because you cannot figure out where to place him which category to actually sort of put him in and say that you know Hera like, writes like that and the moment we actually try to uh, figure out the message of the poem uh, he immediately sort of uh, rejects that as well he says that you know whatever you understood is uh, and to use his word crap he says that a lot in his poetry you know it's, it's crap so yeah I think you know that kind of uh, that very tenuous sort of formation is there in his uh, uh, poetry, where he forces you into a form, but then immediately, uh, you know, uh, sort of challenges it in the same way, right? Great, thank you. Um, any any questions for Mohit? Yeah, I yes, do see one. one. Yeah. Uh, sad boss. Mohit, would you like to read? Uh, would yeah, you yeah, like sure, me sure. to read it out or? I can read it, otherwise you can read Yeah, yeah. All right, so Amrita is asking, thanks for the presentation. Um, do you think there are specific characteristics of the comic slash graphic narrative that allow for the cartographies of the city to be drawn that differentiate it from other visual modes of re representation like maps or photographs? Yes, thanks Amrita for that very, very interesting question because those who are trying to deal with graphic novels are always very much conscious of the fact how this specific genre is so different from cinematic experiences and the photographic imagination which began as a precursor to you know cinema itself in 1885 by linear brothers and all that so my answer to a question like this would be that there's a very interesting specificity which comes up in graphic novels that kind of an embodied experience can be found in cinema also but it, it tends to simplify in the sense like because of the motion pictures, the task from the reader or the viewer is very much limited in the sense the picture is going to tell you a lot of things on its own. You do not have to draw uh, references or inferences from the in-betweenness, which is always absent in a cinematic scale. All right, so that in-betweenness lies in the gutter area, which is only available in the graphic novels. So over there, sometimes, you know, uh, the graphic artists can be very, very, uh, you know, uh, different as far as uh, the dialogue writing is concerned. So they will not show you certain thought bubbles. And then you have to completely depend upon your imagination. As I was trying to talk about Kali, who is the girlfriend from Big Hussein's girlfriend, so to speak, and she is being stalked um, on Delhi uh, streets once upon a time. And then, you know, Brigu suddenly turns up and then the stalker goes away. But in that moment, in case if it is shown in a movie, like that kind of a thing can be shown in a movie and it has been done in so many Bollywood movies as well. Over there, you do not really have to depend upon your imagination. But in this book, suddenly the frames change and we get to see very young Kali, like one can speculate about that. It's not properly, uh, you know, given out to the readers. One can speculate it is a very young um, Kali who is actually on a you know swing and suddenly someone comes and sits next to her and she does not like that kind of a touch and she felt threatened by it and that kind of experience continued with her it remained with her it remained embodied within her being till that point where she now in the present situation encounters that stalker and suddenly Brigu comes and provides that sense of security to her okay so that kind of a thing is very very specific like the lived experience within Delhi that way can be very properly captured within graphic novels. So yes, there are certain cartographical representations available in photographs. So Satish Sharma has done a very extensive work in clicking photographs of different 
aspects of daily life all right so his works are very easily available in many places but he has done a very good job about that and there are certain other photographers like that but the whole idea is that photographs are very still in the sense like those are like snippets of certain areas like the way you would uh, like if i have to go in the bylanes of old delhi i may take a rickshaw and i would be you know traveling around chandni chowk but i would simultaneously be listening to certain kind of cuss words that somebody may be giving out to someone right so that kind of a thing can appear in uh, graphic novels but that kind of a thickening of space right so there's a texture which will added on to my travel during you know uh, in chandni chowk while going towards aldiram's and all those kind of things that kind of a thing would be limited that kind of a thing would be completely non existent in photographs or in a you know map so to speak um i think uh, we will have to wind up um, it's 2 o'clock and i know there's um, after a short break you have another session so thank you so much for a you know for a great panel um, thanks to all the speakers thanks to the audience you've been a great audience uh, i'm sure the you know the engagement can continue the the q and a can continue but uh, um we'll uh, we'll stop here and um, um yeah all all the best for the rest of the conference thank you presenters and thank you ever so gracious uh, to the chair dr mm -hmm. suti khanna it was a delight to listen to all the presenters and to listen to your observations and comments and thank you so much we we can meet after a short break thank, thank you everybody for thank joining us thank you stuti ma'am uh, for chairing this session we are we were so excited to have you here at the conference I just have a short announcement to make. We will reconvene at three o'clock for our fifth plenary session of the conference, and uh, we have uh, Professor Brandon Labelle and Professor Yasmin Arif who will be delivering the plenary talks at three o'clock. So see you, everybody. We are ending the meeting at the moment, so everyone will have to join a fresh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Tuti, and thanks to all the presenters. And we'll meet again. Uh, though the session starts at three, but we'll meet a little bit before that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.